Let's look at let's look at modern college engineering and ask some questions. Which is an advantageous way to represent graphs in memory? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. So, which is an advantageous way to represent graphs in memory? Is the question. Can you hear me? Can you hear the question? Which is an advantageous way to represent graphs in memory? Did you hear my question? Can the moderator respond? So, uh, this is group chat, no? Yes, group chat, but on the colleges down the time, the little ability to get that. RGCET, can you tell me whether you can hear me? Yeah, he is muted and next to me. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. MIT Mirek, can you hear me? Data Institute, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can hear what I'm saying, right? Yes. Okay. Modern College of Engineering. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm just going through some questions here. Which is an advantageous way to represent graphs in memory? There are two types of representations of graphs. One is using the matrix representation where you have a two-dimensional array or you could use a adjacency list representation. Adjacency list is, uh, it depends upon what your application is. If you want to have random access to the vertices of a graph, where a matrix representation is better. Whereas if you're looking at something like Dijkstra's algorithm being run to find the shortest path, for example, an adjacency list may be a better representation. So there is nothing like um, the uh, kind of representation, depend, uh, at least with respect to graphs, depends upon the problem that you're working with. Okay? If you're um, perhaps looking at um, coloring problem for that matter. An adjacency list representation may be very good to solve the coloring problem. But if I'm looking at, you know, I want to find out from which node to which node I have a connection. Then instead of, if you're using an adjacency list representation, I have to go through the array serially. Whereas if I use an adjacency matrix representation, and if I have a way of indexing a particular node directly, then random access is possible. So it depends upon the particular problem, whether you use adjacency list or adjacency matrix. If your matrix is quite dense, in the sense that you have large number of edges in the matrix, then adjacency matrix representation is better. If the number of edges are very small in the given graph, then adjacency list is generally preferred. Okay? Uh, did you get my answer? Fine. All right, the next question that was asked was, what is the practical usage of different data structures? There are a number of applications. See, the most important point about data structures is that, especially the abstract uh, data type variety, which was taught to you in class, is primarily that, for example, if you look at today, C++, C, and so on, or even Python for that matter, have what are called static template libraries, okay? And here, for example, something is already implemented for you if you want to. You, for example, if I'm looking at recursion, you can't do without a stack. If I have very large uh, strings that need to be represented, the, the queue is a mandatory representation. A binary search tree, for that matter, is extremely useful for uh, representing dictionaries or variant circuit like the B tree, for that matter, are also used for representing uh, dictionaries. B trees are used even for disk accesses. When you're talking about binary search tree and all that, everything is sitting in the memory. Whereas when you're looking at a B tree, for example, all the uh, data is sitting on the disk and it gives you a very fast way of 
accessing data that is residing on the disk. There cannot be a question about data structures today for the simple reason that the let me give you a very simple example. Okay? If you have a particular data structure and you because of the way you have implemented the data structure, if you got a time complexity in one case of order n, another case you got order n squared because of poor implementation. If you today, you know, especially in the context of big data and other things, you have millions of records. Okay. So this n squared becomes very, very large in that particular context, and you'll actually see that, especially when you're working with machine learning and other things, when you're looking at uh, algorithms with train, for example, train the model. Sometimes you will find that a program which take ten, takes 10 days can perhaps be done in one day. Okay? That's the kind of benefit that you can get if you implement good straight data structures to solve problems. Okay? And uh, the what should be the preferred language uh, when you're looking at real-time implementation? Yes? I would advise, that's the next question that was asked, I would advise that you use C or C++ because they are the fastest. To give you some numbers, if you write a program in C to access an array, and you write the same program to access an array in C++, access the array in Java or Python or Perl for that matter, you'll find that C is the fastest. Okay, so it's very very close to the machine. At the same time, it is a higher level language. Normally, real time implementations use C as the programming language. But C, of course, the difficulty is it's not very easy to implement. You do a lot of careful programming for the fact. And there was another question. If a graph is directed, then how to traverse the breadth search graph? It's not a problem. All that you have to do is put your forward arrays, for forward arcs with one, and reverse arcs you set at zero. And you traverse along the forward arcs. So just like how you would search in a uh, like in depth first search, you, follow, you go on the forward ask. The two examples we took depth first search using directed graph and depth first search using undirected graph, just to give you two different examples of the problems. That's all. It's the same way that you process item. How to multiply? The next question was how to multiply two polynomials. The best way to do this is you represent the coefficients of a polynomial. Yeah, can you hear me? Where can I respond? RGC, please respond. Your yeah, questions yeah, yeah, are being yeah. answered. Wait, wait. Amas, please switch off your mobile phones. Your mobile phones. Yeah. In the application, yes. Please wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think I will enable the microphone has been enabled. RGC, your microphone is enabled. Yes, yes, yes. But we are not able to see the other video. The number video connected. Let me uh, use the writing. How do I write this one? Okay. So let us say the question was. Yeah. I'll just go. I'll just go one moment. One moment. Madam, one moment. Madam, one moment. Madam, one moment. Madam, yeah, please. Uh, colleges, colleges, I am muting your microphones. Please don't make noise. Colleges, please don't make noise. Pay attention to the screen. If you want to ask a question, come close to the laptop or a microphone and ask a question. 
or raise your hands and I'll, I will unmute your mic. Okay, I'm just going to write the questions, okay? Advantage, way, advantageous way to represent graphs. The two representations, matrix, slash, edge matrix, slash, edge list. I'm not going to next year. The uh, depends on the problem. Oh, yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Next question. Basically, if you're looking at <clears throat> a good uh, data structure for implementation, if you use a good data structure and if you organize the data properly, for example, linear search would cost you this much, whereas you're organized, for example, in sorted order, then the binary search would yield you a much better search time. Okay. And next question, preferred language. real time I would say C but um, fastest and um, next question last question three question four implementation of heat Using an array. Okay. You always implement a heap using an array, that's the most beneficial. Okay. Then the next question five. Graph is directed. How to perform DFS? Let's say I have something like this.
you follow basically you try to travel as widely as possible so starting from the node a i'd go to e b first and then to f put these two in the queue okay then you start with b and go to c and uh, c and d will go into the queue and you go through the same process basically follow the algorithm with forward arc appropriately put uh, nodes in the queue when you have exhausted from a node is exhausted go to a an unvisited okay so it is not very different then how to multiply two polynomials Let's say I have uh, Let's say we had two polynomials like this. Let me call this uh, p of x, and let me call this q of x. You want to multiply p of x into q of x. Okay. What is the maximum degree that the elements can have? Because can have. So basically, when you're looking at this, this is basically um, a n x n. A n minus one multiplied by B n minus one and so on up to B n. Okay. So if you look at these two polynomials which I want to multiply, the maximum degree that that be that can be in the product. Uh, let me call it r of x. Um, this is equal to let's say r of x. Maximum degree is what now? It will be a n into b n into x n into x n, right? This will be the largest degree. That means what? The degree of the polynomial is going to be n plus n. Okay. And what is the smallest degree? You have a not plus a not into b not. Therefore, that one's degree is x to the power of zero, which is equal to uh, that. That is the smallest degree. So now, what you need to do when you are multiplying two arrays, so when you are multiplying two polynomials, store p of x in let's say an array A, going from a zero to or uh, up to. The nth degree. Okay. Then q of x is stored in b zero to b. R of x goes from r of uh, let's say let me call it c of zero. And what is the maximum degree? C of n plus n. Okay. Compute this product. It's very simple. Um, what are we looking at? 
we have. So basically, if you look at the way this works, let's take an example. Okay, let us say I have uh, x squared plus 2x plus 1 multiplied by, uh, let me say, x minus 1. Let's say this is p of x and this is q of x. Okay, now I'll say a of 0 is equal to 1. You store the coefficients in the end a of 1 equal to 2 and a of 2 equal to 1. Okay. Similarly, you store b of 0 equal to minus 1 and b of 1 equal to 1. When I take the product, what are all the polynomials that are, what do you have here now? You have, let me just multiply this. Okay. Actually, I have x cubed plus what we have. Okay. So, what we see is that the polynomial is of degree 3. So, I have to add all of these together. x cubed plus 2x squared plus 2x squared sorry. x cubed plus x squared I subtract this and minus x minus 1 is your answer. Now, how can we do this program? Okay. So, what I do is, if I define an array C, 0 to n plus n, set it equal to 0, initialize them to 0, initialize to 0. Now, clearly, if you look at the previous thing here, now notice that this is A0. This is A1 and this is A2 and this is B1 and this is B0. So, if you look at it here, B1 is multiplied with A2 and what happens? The degree of the, uh, that term is what now? 2 plus 1. Okay. So, that becomes x cubed. Okay. Similarly, this one here, A1 is multiplied with B1 which gives me 2x squared. Okay. So, degree of the polynomial becomes the sum of the indices of the arrays a and b. Okay. So, similarly here, if you see 1, this is of degree 1, degree 0 and this is of degree 1 here and I multiply x with this which will give me this term x 1 plus 0 is equal to 1. Okay. So, it is degree is 1. Okay. So, this is precisely what you do. Similarly, for the next one, if you see what is happening now, if I look at minus 1 multiplied with x squared, this will be minus x squared. So, what is happening now? This is of degree 0, this is of degree 2 and therefore, the sum of the two degrees, 2 plus 0 is 2 and that is why you get this minus x squared. Where should this be accumulated? What we do is, the idea is very simple. So, let us look at this particular problem. So, I have here C of 0 equal to 0 initially, c of 1 is the maximum degree that is possible, 0 and so on and we are having the maximum degree of 3, right. C, c of 0 up to c of 3 is equal to 0. This is what I initialize first. Then what are we looking at? Basically, if you notice the problem here, every term of A is multiplied with every term of B. So, that means what I have two loops, one loop going through the array, another loop going through the array B. and let us see how we do. So, I will just have a simple uh, statement like this less than uh, n, assuming that n is the size of the array and for j plus 
all that I need to do is C of i plus g is equal to C of i plus g plus A of i plus i. This is all there is to do. So what's happening here? I am multiplying the i at the, the coefficient of the um, polynomial t of x which is stored in the array at the i at index and that is multiplied with the um, polynomial q of x whose um, uh, the uh, bj corresponds to the j corresponds to the uh, index to, to the uh, if you go back to this particular polynomial here yeah. what is it that we are storing if you notice here so this is stored in a2 a1 a0 that means what am i storing in a2 i'm storing one here i'm storing two here and i'm storing one here similarly i'm storing b of one is one and this one is minus one so what we're doing is notice that corresponding to the location uh, corresponding to the degree of the uh, term we have a particular index corresponding right and we store at that particular index in the array the coefficient of that particular degree now if you notice here when we multiplied x squared plus 2x plus 1 a of 2 got multiplied with b1 to give you a degree of x cube right so that will have to be stored in c of 3 and that's precisely what we are doing c of i plus j is equal to c of i plus j plus a of i plus uh, star b of j so i and j are the coefficients of the two polynomials a of i corresponds to the uh, ith coefficient in polynomial p of x and what does the ith coefficient represent it represents that uh, that uh, term with a particular degree of x similarly the array b at the j index contains the particular term with an degree of j okay and this is all there is to this polynomial multiplication okay. I hope this is clear. Are there any questions? Are there any questions from anybody? Colleges, I have unmuted. <laughs> Colleges, I have unmuted your microphones. Please go ahead and mm -hmm. you can ask your questions. Please, please sit down properly. Please sit down properly and go to your laptop or your desktop microphone and speak to your microphone. Uh, are these uh, colleague? Hello. Uh, am I minute? MIT minutes properly. MIT minute, you have to hear your voice. Are you what is the question I can't hear you uh, who, is, who, is, who wants to ask question Siddhartha one moment one moment please. Siddhartha please go ahead yes sir so we have a doubt regarding the permutation and combination what are the best algorithms for writing the permutation and combination best algorithm what do you mean by best algorithm I mean the best technique for writing the efficient technique for writing the permutation forming the sets. Okay, tell me what is the problem with let us take NCR, okay? Let's say I have to compute NCR. Okay. This is the formula for this is what? Factorial N by factorial N minus R into factorial R. Okay. Now can you tell me how will you compute this? I 
I'm asking you a question. Suppose you have, okay, let me give you an answer, okay. Suppose I have factorial n, I have a fact of n, which computes the factorial of n. Okay. Now, if I use this function, what will I get? What, to see any problem with this. So, clearly, I can compute factorial of n by, I can say fact of n by fact of n minus r into fact of r. Right. Now, what will happen with this? Suppose I give you fact of 500. What will happen? Can you tell me? I will try running it with this. So that the college. Look at this. I have a factorial function which computes factors of n. So what I am doing is I am simply computing fact of n divided by fact of n minus r into fact of r. What will happen? What will happen? Similarly, if I am doing NPR, what is NPR? N factorial by? NPR is equal to factorial n by factorial n minus r, right? Now, suppose I did this, what will happen? Have you tried running this on your computer? What happens? I have a fact function. Remember this is, so what is factorial of, what is factorial of n equal to? Factorial of n is fact of n into n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 and so on, right? Into 1. Correct. If I just expand. So, can you tell me what will happen if I did this on the computer? N, n into fact of n minus 1. Yeah, doesn't matter. N into fact of n minus 1, whatever you want to do. What will happen? The factorial of a given number is large. Yeah, yeah. My question to you is, if I give large numbers, if I give n as, let's say, even 25, what will happen? Ah. What will it do? Very quickly saturate your space in terms of numbers. Okay. So, you can't compute it. Alright. So, what you do is you try to simplify. NCR can be written as N minus 1 CR minus 1 into N minus 1 plus N minus 1 CR. What is the advantage of this? Do you see any advantage? See, what is happening is, okay, see what is interesting about this formula versus here, if I look at this formula, if I look at, sorry, let me go to the previous one. If I look at this formula and then I compare it with this formula. Which one will give you a result for large numbers? I am asking you a question. Second one. Ah, second one. Very good. Why so? Because it is continuously noticed that if you notice here, what is the reason for this is primarily that if I did this computation for example and did the end factorial computation, then what is going to happen? It will run out of the space of the numbers. But here what it's doing is it's reducing the problem to smaller problems and solving each one of the smaller problems. So what is interesting is that NCR 
actually fits into the space of the number but because of the way you have performed the computation it does not fit in. okay so always it is important for you whether it is oops, whether it is npr ncr for example make sure that you have found okay always reduce the problem to something that is tractable and work out the solution okay so for example if i am looking at npr it's easier than ncr all that you have to do is you only need to compute not compute the numerator factorial and denominator factorial separately simplify the problem and compute it. so there is also quite a bit of understanding of the mathematics of whatever problem you are given to i mean it's don't think that computer science is simply about programming and you are done no you have to spend time on understanding the problem and working out the problem. okay then there was one more question that was asked so is this clear what we are doing here clear is not Okay. So basically, the the fundamental difference is <coughs> writing it on the paper does not matter, but when I'm using a computer to solve the problem, I must realize that the computer has what is called finite space. Okay, when you're writing it on paper, the precision with which you can compute anything is infinite, but when I'm writing it on the when I'm using a computer to do it, there's only a finite space. arithmetic that is possible so what you try to do is within the finite arithmetic that is possible try to develop algorithms which make the uh, you know which will make the program more efficient or solvable within the space of the computer okay the lots of such examples that you come across in practice in fact for example let me um, let me see if i can give you this suppose i have to compute the sum of let's say i want to uh, let's say i want to take the sum of oops what did i do suppose i want to compute i'm not able to write this something is wrong oh. madam choose the pen on the top madam yeah i do have the pen but i think i did something to it it's not writing one more button just say come told me not to press the something <laughs> something he told me not to press i did not know what i should not press sorry <laughs> boys and girls writing writing problem open pen second madam i will or should i close this off madam is coming madam okay, what should i do can open the pen So let us say you now I want to take the sum of v to the power of some point not 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 plus t to the power of point not not not. What do you think will be the problem? What will happen to this number? Suppose I want to take exponential sum. Now let us say I write a program for this. What will I use? I I, I write e to the power of x. Equals one plus x plus x squared by two factorial plus x cubed by two factorial, and so on. Let's say I take some hundred terms. Do well. this approximation. Then when I take the sum of these two numbers, what will happen? Not put the value. Huh? What will happen? Is that? Can you tell me? What will happen? This expansion is too small, right? So what will you have? You will get actually what you will get is if I take this, this will come to be zero. 
but you know in many problems in machine learning and other things this is the probability values will be like this very very small then what you do is you take the algorithms which say take log of this 1 divided by so pi not 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 1 and divided by 1 over 2 then you take it into the power of okay you do a subtraction you do a sum and all kinds of things to make sure let's say this was minus here i'm just giving you an example so when you divide these two what happens is these two numbers get very close to each other suppose it was minus 1 okay this is just to give you an example all right then what you do is you take the log of this thing and then you when you then the ratios become small when you convert the sum to a form like this compute this i don't remember the details of the algorithm there are algorithms for all of this notice that we take e to the power of x plus e to the power of x but what am i doing here i'm taking e to the power of log of something some difference there is a formula which will tell you e to the power of log of a by b plus something. don't remember the formula you can get this on the right there are algorithms for all of this so this is something that you must remember that whenever for any problem you have to know your domain and at particular domain find an appropriate algorithm so okay you, you cannot do it just say i program it as it is and things will work it will not work okay it is pretty well known that we cannot do infinite precision arithmetic know the precision of the arithmetic of your problem and appropriately develop an algorithm one more let me just Do you want anything? Yeah, no. I'm just looking at my notes that I have. I want to complete them. All right. Yeah. So what you do for this log addition is the following. Let me just give this example. You what you do is basically we are looking at log of x. log of y and i want this sum also in some log of z let us see. then what we do is <coughs> we check if x is less than y then we um you compute whichever is the for example If x is less than y, then you take difference of y minus x, and then you um, compute z is equal to exponential of the difference, which is what we can do. And then this is the algorithm. Then you write uh, x. Plus 
x plus uh, x plus log of 1 plus z e dx. Okay. This is the way we work. Okay. So this is the answer to um, this is the value of log z. Then I take exponential of z. I'll get the sum of. So what am I doing now? Let's go back to the problem that we had. I have exponential of let's say of x, exponential of y. I convert this to log of x plus log of y. Then I get log of z using this formula. This is a formula which is well established, available on the web. Okay. This is precisely what I have looked at. Then this will give me z. Okay, z is equal to x plus log of 1 plus z. And uh, then I take the e to the power of, because this is log, right? This is this is giving me z here. So this is log of z. I take e to the power of z. Once I take e to the power of z, I have the sum of this also in some form. Okay? Is this clear? What I am trying to do? Do you understand what I am trying to do? So this is how one thing one is possible. Any problem that is given, please try to simplify it first mathematically. See if I can compute given the finite precision arithmetic that is available on the computer. Okay? And once that is available, then you go back and encode. Because what we want to do is, see we do not as far as possible we want to exploit the precision that is available on the computer. Okay? You don't want to go to double precision. Because if you go to double precision, what's happening? If you're looking at a real number which uses two words, double precision will make four, sometimes eight words. Okay? So your memory reduces. So you want to store as much as possible in the memory and also make meaningful computation. So this is something that you must keep track of with respect to the algorithms. All right? Is this clear? Yeah? Okay. So let's go on to the, are there any other questions? Let's look at the next question. Yeah. Um, it has a yeah. Tell me. Can you tell me what question, are there any other questions that you have? I can't hear you. Siddhartha, is it? We are muted. Hello? I can't hear you. Please unmute Siddhartha. Hmm? Hmm? Can you hear me? Oh, we, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Okay, what I'll do is I'll the next question was how to oops. how to 
binary search panel. The simplest thing to do is a recursion tree. I'll show you how to do this. Okay. So let's say I have n elements. Let's say these are three. Okay. Let's say I want to perform binary search analysis. The simplest thing that I will tell you is the easiest way to do this is use what is called a recursion tree. So what am I doing now? I am dividing this into two parts of length two. Then again I am dividing into two parts of length two, two parts of length two and then finally I am dividing into parts of length. Okay. So now, if you look at it, what is it that we are doing? Every time we are dividing the array into two parts and we are only, so let us say I want to check if number 16 is present in the array. So first time, what, do I do? what did I do? I divided the array into two. I compared it with 17 here because that is the middle of the array. It is less than 17. So you go to the left of the array. Now again, what do I do? Okay. Then what am I doing now? I am dividing again into two parts. Then I am looking at only these four elements because 16 is less than 17. I am looking at 3, 8, 15 and 17. Again, I divide this array into two parts. Now what is it that we have? It is greater than the middle value. Therefore, it has to be present in this part. So now I compare, only I am looking at 15 and 17. Now again I divided it into two parts. Then it is greater than 15. Then I check whether it is equal to this element or not. It is not. So you see the array is not present. So how many comparisons did we make? Initially we compared one here. One comparison here. Two comparisons here three comparisons here, finally a fourth comparison. So now, suppose the array became 16 sites, then what will happen? I will just have one more, suppose the array was of size 16 instead of, then that means suppose the array was size 16, then suppose the array was of size 16, then what would have, what will happen is it would have just increased, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay. So all that would have happened is I would have had one more comparison and the rest of it, again let us say I am looking at the number 60. So I would have divided into two parts again, 8 elements each. Okay. So what is, so when you look at it for example, it has, if, even though the array became double the size, I have only one more comparison. So you can keep doing this, if I look at 32 for, exa for example, if the number of elements was 32, then I would have one more comparison, okay. So basically then you start realizing that actually there is a relationship between this and it becomes log of n to the base 2 plus 1 is the total number of comparisons. Okay. How did we come up with this? Let us go back to this problem here. What did we do here? We had 8 elements and so 8 is the total number of elements. Then what did we do? We divided it into 2 parts. Then you compared with 1 part. Then again divided into 2 parts, you compared with 1 part. Again divided into two parts and compared with one. So if you look at it here, one comparison here, another comparison here, third comparison here, fourth comparison. Okay. So when you look at it, there are eight elements.
Yeah, a small request to Mr. Dhananji. Sir, now a new feature had come in that. What's actually happening is, if the speaker does not respond for a second or so, the audio gets muted. Again, when he starts speaking, the audio fades it. You understood what I'm speaking? Suppose if I am taking a class, I say, hello students. Now let me explain. So what I have done now is I have formally written. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now, if you notice, I have given a formal here performing the same analysis. So if I look at T of n, then the final array is getting divided by two. T of n, let's say, is the complexity of uh, this algorithm. Then what I will do is I can write T of n as equal to T of n by 2 because in binary search we are dividing the array by 2 plus some constant. We assume that multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, all of them are the some constant con amount of time. Okay. Then this is the this is called the recurrence equation. Oops, I not able to This is called a recurrence equation. Okay, so the recurrence equation says initially the array size is n, then what the co the cost of computing the time complexity of the algorithm is equal to the cost of computing the time complexity of the algorithm, where the array size is divided by two because I have made one comparison with the middle element, and the comparison is going to cost you some c. That's the meaning of this. So let's take this example. When I take eight elements, the cost, what are we doing? We are comparing with the middle element. This is this cost over here. Then we are making the array half. Okay, that is the T of 4. Now, T of 4, what is what are we doing? We are again dividing the array by 2. And the complexity of the comparison with the element is what order. Okay. Next, what we do, we want to do the array of size 2. I divide it into two parts of, uh, of size 1. And that is the complexity of this. 
and the comparison order one and then finally p of and it's only one element that I am comparing therefore time complexity is order if I look at the total time here these are the four sums that I have taken this is order one order one order one this is how you compute time complex now what we want to do is because the array size is n we need to relate the total number of comparisons that we have made with the size of the array. There are two kinds of size. One is size of the input when you do complexity analysis. Analysis is based on the size of the input. And what is the size of the input here? In binary search, it is the size of the array. Okay. Similarly, let me do one. Uh, suppose I am doing uh, sorting. Let's take a simple example of selections. So let's say I have. Selection sort of int n. Array of size n is being sorted. Then what do I do in the sorting algorithm? I am ignoring all the uh, variables. My program won't compile. For J going from I plus 1, J. What do we do? Selection sort is essentially this. What do I do? I start with this element. I compare with all the elements then what am I going to do I am going to move the smallest element to the beginning of the array then next what I what do I do I can't start from here so what do I have now let us say I have 5 4 and 6 now again I compare this with all the elements 4 is smaller than 5 therefore I will move here 4 and 5 and 5 and 6 are the correct number. So what I do is, I first define, let us say this is the array A of 5, A of 0, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3. Okay. So what am I doing now? I am setting, there are online right? Yeah. So let us go back to this. So what we do is we set the small element to a of i. Then for j equal to i plus 1, j less than n, I check if a of j is less than small. If it is less than small, then I initialize a variable called log which is equal to j. Okay. So I just keep repeating this. Yes. Can can you can you hear me? I do this. Okay. Once this is done, that means at the end of this one execution of this loop, I'm going to have the location of the smallest element in the end. Then next, what I will do is I will simply exchange a of i with A of log. Okay. So let us look at this problem over here. So I go through the psi equal to 0. I have the smallest element 5 there. Then I go from j equal to i plus 1 to n. 
3, 4, 6. Amongst these, which is the smallest element, 3 is the smallest element. Where is its location? At 1. Therefore, J will give me the value of 1. Then what do I do? I simply exchange the values of these two. So, the, what am I going to do? I am going to put temp is equal to A of I. A of I equals A of log. A of log equals temp. Okay. So, that is the outer loop. Okay. So, notice I want you to let's look at the time complexity of this. If I look at the time complexity of this for i equal to 0, there is an assignment here. Cost is order 1. There is a test here. This cost is constant, order 1. As I say, you know, all constant time operations are written as order 1 or theta 1. Increment is also order 1. Then, when I am looking at time complexity levels, order 1, order 1, order 1, and what we are saying is, this is like a sequence of three programs. I am assigning the value of i, I am comparing the value of i, and I am incrementing the value of i. Therefore, this statement is going to take max of order 1, comma, order 1, comma, oops. Order 1, comma, order 1. So, what is that now? All of them are order 1. Therefore, this takes order 1 time. Now, here I am assignment. This is also order 1. Okay. Here, this assignment, for example, testing comparison, this is also order 1. This comparison is also order 1. Okay. And this is also order 1. Okay. And now, exchanging in the outer group. That comes into the outer group. So, this is in the previous group, right? Now, what I want you to realize is something over here. Now, if you look at it, the, if you look at this comparison over here, this is order 1, this is order 1, this is order 1. There is again, there is a sequence of steps here. Maximum of all of this is also order 1. But, this is getting executed n times. So, we call this product of programs. So, what we are looking at is we have two situations. A program segment can be made up of the sum of P1 plus P2 or a program segment is made up of P1 into P2. So, this is called the sum rule. In the sum rule, we take max of the time complexities of order of P1 and order of P2, whatever, order of the uh, one. I should write it like this. This is the max of the uh, time complexity of P1 time complexity of P2. Okay. We call this the sum rule. When do we apply the product rule? We apply the product rule, for example, here this is whole thing when you, so you can apply the sum rule here. Order 1, order 1, order 1 because they are all one after the other. Sum of two programs. Okay. In sequence. Therefore, this whole thing, this whole loop, the execution of this loop is going to cost order 1. But this loop is likely to be executed n times. Therefore, it becomes order of n into 1. Product of two programs. Okay. So, product of two programs, if this has a time complexity of order of f of n and this has a time complexity of order of p2 has order of g of n, then the time complexity of uh, are you able to see the screen? Colleges? Huh? Okay. okay. So, when you look at time complexity of product of programs, for example, I said if EP1 ran in order of F and P2 ran in order of G of N, then one loop within the other, if I have for something and I have 
this P2 here and this is P1 here, then the time complexity becomes order of f of n into g of n. Okay. So, this is called the product rule. P1, one program within another program because the for loop is one program and within the for loop you have another program, you apply what is called the product. So, once you use these two rules, most of the things must be very clear. There are um, uh, there are other kinds of time complexities for example, size of the input sometimes. For example, when you are working with a number theory for example, if you are looking at prime class 1643 for example, when you look at time complexity, you look at the number of digits in that is what log of the to write this number for example, how many positions do you have? If it is a four digit number, the number is very large 1643, but there is only four digits long. So, the if you take the log of this, this will be about four. So, we talk about in such a case the size as the log of n. Um, you can take base 2 or 10 does not matter because it is only a constant that distinguishes between the two of them. So, number theoretic problems like factorial, prime classification, these are all beyond the scope of this particular course. Time complexity for all these is very, very high because when you are talking about uh, the uh, value of n here, the value of n can be very, very large. And notice that for we're, when we talk about um, in terms of log complexity, it should take how many times do you write with the pen the given number. Okay? So, that is beyond uh, the scope of this particular. Madam, uh, MIT Meerut has a question, Madam. Okay, yeah, please. Madam, they they asked, they uh, sent us a message saying, when do we use double pointer function? Double pointer function, doubly linked list. What do you mean by double pointer? Are you looking at something? Um, what do you mean by double pointer? Are you looking at in star star a? Mirit, uh, Mirit, can you please explain uh, to Madam, the uh, what the question is? Or are you looking at a node with two links, forward pointer and a backward pointer? They are trying to speak, but I think their uh, microphone, I do not know they have a problem. Uh, Mirit, please, uh, please type in a message. Please type the question. Madam, they have typed the question, Madam. I think you are able to see that message. Able to see that. What do you mean by function pointer here? What is the func of func 0? Is that a variable or what? The typing again. It is a function and you have double pointers to the function. Are you sure of this? Alright, I see what you mean. See, basically saying that I have in star star uh, function of some uh, find. Is this what you mean? Is this what you mean? Yes, okay. So, can you tell me what this, what is the meaning of the star star here? Can you tell me what star star means there? What is it returning? It is returning a pointer to a two dimensional array. Are you with me on this? Are 
Are you with me on this? Uh, Mirat, since your audio is not heard, please keep typing your messages. This is a pointer. Is this clear? For example, uh, okay, let me give you, maybe uh, let me uh, try to give you an example. You know, int main, this takes this argument, int argc, comma, char, star, star, argb. What is the meaning of this? Cat. Star star argument. Can you tell me what's the meaning of that argument which is being passed? What this means is the following. Have you uh, uh, written C programs with command line arguments? Yes. Okay. If you've already written C programs with command line arguments, what this means is let us say I'm saying sort. Uh, let me write this back here. Suppose I'm saying the program is sort. Let's say I'm running it in Linux dash slot sort. I am giving one argument, um, let me say a string here which I am sorting, let me say a one. Let's say I have uh, Let's say I have C, B, D, A, uh, F is a string that I am parsing and uh, then I am giving a file in which I want to write. Let us say file dot So let's say this is what I want to sort. Okay. So what am I giving? I am giving one. Notice that this cat star rb means what? This name of the program is a string. The argument to the program is another string. And the argument output from the program is also a string. Therefore, cat star star rb consists of three elements. First element corresponds to the name of the program. Second element, the first argument to the program. The third element, which is also a string corresponding to the third argument to the program. So this argv means it is a set of character strings. Okay, is this clear? So that's what I meant when I said it is a two-dimensional array. Argv of zero in this example is the variable sort. Argv oops of one is c b d a f. And argv of 2 is file dot out. Okay. So basically, star star means a two dimensional array. Are you with me on this? This is understood? Okay. All right. So then there are, the, I think, are there any other questions that you have? Uh, colleges, please uh, please raise hands so that I can unmute your microphones, please. 
BBP Siddhartha, do you have any question? Yeah, one moment. BBP Siddhartha, I'll just unmute your microphone. Yeah, please go ahead. Siddhartha, please go ahead. No, no question, sir. No question. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have you understood complexity analysis now? How it's being performed? Is complexity analysis so or RG set or whatever? RG set, I have seen you uh, waiting to ask a question. Do you have a question? You can raise your hand. Yeah, are there any other questions? Madam, uh, Madam RG said seems to be having a question. One moment, please. Okay. Arjit, please go ahead. For NPD exam, what is the question uh, pattern for uh, data structure programming? Data structures and programming, I can't give you this detail. It will be very similar to what your assignments. It's not going to be very different. For the data structures part, we will give you some kind of data structure which is already implemented. And using the abstract data type, how to solve problems. I think you already done examples of this kind on the assignments. Okay. Abstract data type based programming. So something is designed and given to you. See, why is this so important? It's, this is the precursor for what is called object-oriented programming. What did you learn in object-oriented programming in your courses? You would have said, you know, encapsulation, right? Data hiding, polymorphism, and all that stuff. Most important thing is encapsulation. What are you saying? You're going to hide everything, hide all the data. Okay. So why? What is what is the importance of something like this? The implementation of the data structures is hidden from the user of the program. When you use static template libraries in C++ or in Java, you do not know how a vector is implemented. You use a vector, integer for example, in, if I say int a, do I know how a, in the integer uh, is in data, data type is implemented in C? You do not know about it. That is also object orientation. And if you are looking at so the whole idea is, let me give you an uh, example again here. Yeah. Colleges, do you, uh, any of you have a question, please? I'm not able to. I'm not able to go to the. Uh, Siddhartha, speak into the microphone. Yeah, I think I've seen as a notepad here. Notepad is gone. How do I fix this? Uh, one, one moment, madam. Notepad is gone. I only have Google Chrome and Skype and other things. One moment, madam. Why does the notepad go off? Notepad is What was I talking about? Um, I've lost that. One minute. What was I? I don't have the uh, earlier stuff that is there. I I seem to. Have, what was I? What were we discussing some time back? Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah, I was talking about the use of it.
Okay, now I can share this, right? One second, it's an untitled notepad. Okay. What did you do? Went up somewhere. In the notepad, I did not get that uh, menu to write with. Notepad. Notepad. Are they here? They may be there. No, no, notepad. Journal. 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 Journal.